Prologue of A Trace of Memory by Keith Laumer. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nick Bolka. A Trace of Memory by Keith Laumer. Prologue. He awoke and lay for a moment looking up at a low ceiling, dimly visible in a faint red glow, feeling the hard mat under his back. He turned his head, saw a wall and a panel on which a red indicator light glared. He swung his legs over the side of the narrow couch and sat up. The room was small, gray-painted, unadorned. Pain throbbed in his forearm. He shook back the loose sleeve of the strange purple garment, saw a pattern of tiny punctures in the skin. He recognized the mark of a feeding hunter. Who would have dared? A dark shape on the floor caught his eye. He slid from the couch, knelt by the still body of a man in a purple tunic, stained black with blood. Gently he rolled the body onto its back. A Marilyn! He seized the limp wrist. There was a faint pulse. He rose and saw a second body. And near the door, two more. Quickly he went to each. All three were dead, hideously slashed. Only a Marilyn still breathed, faintly. He went to the door, shouted into the darkness. The ranged shelves of a library gave back a brief echo. He turned back to the gray-walled room, noticed a recording monitor against a wall. He fitted the neurodes to the dying man's temples. But for this gesture of recording a Maryland's life memories, there was nothing he could do. He must get him to a therapist, and quickly. He crossed the library, found a great echoing hall beyond. This was not the Sapphire Palace beside the shallow sea. The lines were unmistakable. He was aboard a ship, a far voyager. Why? How? He stood uncertain. The silence was absolute. He crossed the great hall and entered the observation lounge. Here lay another dead man, by his uniform a member of the crew. He touched a knob and the great screens glowed blue. A giant crescent swam into focus, locked, soft blue against the black of space. Beyond it a smaller companion hung, gray-blotched, airless. What worlds were these? An hour later, he had ranged the vast ship from end to end. In all, seven corpses, cruelly slashed, peopled the silent vessel. In the control sector, the communication lights glowed, but to his call there was no answer from the strange world below. He turned to the recording room. A Marilyn still breathed weakly. The memory recording had been completed. All that the dying man remembered of his long life was imprinted now in the silver cylinder. It remained only to color-code the trace. His eye was caught by a small cylinder projecting from the aperture at the side of the high couch where he had awakened. His own memory trace. So he himself had undergone the change. He took the color-banded cylinder, thrust it into a pocket, then whirled at a sound. A nest of hunters, swarming gloves of pale light, clustered at the door. Then they were on him. They pressed close, humming in their eagerness. Without the proper weapon, he was helpless. He caught up the limp body of a Marilyn. With the hunters trailing in a luminous stream, he ran with his burden to the shuttle boat bay. Three shuttles lay in their cradles. He groped to a switch his head swimming with the sulphurous reek of the hunters. Life flooded the bay, driving them back. He entered the lifeboat, placed the dying man on a cushioned couch. It had been long since he had manned the controls of a ship, but he hadn't forgotten. A Marilyn was dead when the lifeboat reached the planetary surface. The vessel settled gently, and the lock cycled. He looked out at a vista of ragged forest. This was no civilized world. Only the landing ring and the clearing round it showed the presence of man. There was a hollow in the earth by a square marker block at the eastern perimeter of the clearing. 
He hoisted the body of Amerlin to his back and moved heavily down the access ladder. Working barehanded, he deepened the hollow, placed the body in it, scraped earth over it. Then he rose and turned back toward the shuttle boat. Forty feet away, a dozen men, squat, bearded, wrapped in the shaggy hides of beasts, stood between him and the access ladder. The tallest among them shouted, raised a bronze sword threateningly. Behind these, others clustered at the ladder. Motionless, he watched as one scrambled up, reached the top, disappeared into the boat. In a moment, the savage reappeared at the opening and hurled down handfuls of small bright objects. Shouting, others clambered up to share the loot. The first man again vanished within the boat. Before the foremost of the others had gained the entry, the port closed, shutting off a terrified cry from within. Men dropped from the ladder as it swung up. The boat rose slowly, angling toward the west, dwindling. The savages shrank back, awed. The man watched until the tiny blue light was lost against the sky. End of Prologue Chapter One of A Trace of Memory by Keith Laumer This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The ad read Soldier of Fortune Seeks Companion in Arms to Share Unusual Adventure. Foster, Box 19, Mayport. I crumpled the newspaper and tossed it in the general direction of the wire basket beside the park bench, pushed back a slightly frayed cuff, and took a look at my bare wrist. It was just habit. The watch was in a hock shop in Tupelo, Mississippi. It didn't matter. I didn't have to know what time it was. Across the park, most of the store windows were dark along the side street. There were no people in sight. They were all home now, having dinner. As I watched, the lights blinked off in the drug store with the bottles of colored water in the window. That left the candy and cigar emporium at the end of the line. I fidgeted on the hard bench and felt for a cigarette I didn't have. I wished the old boy back of the counter would call it a day and go home. As soon as it was dark enough, I was going to rob his store. I wasn't a full-time stick-up artist. Maybe that's why that nervous feeling was playing around under my ribcage. There was really nothing to it. The wooden door with the hardware counter lock that would open almost as easily without a key as with one. The sardine can metal box with the day's receipts in it. I'd be on my way to the depot with fare to Miami in my pocket ten minutes after I cracked the door. I'd learned a lot harder tricks than petty larceny back when I had a big future ahead with Army intelligence. That was a long time ago, and I'd had a lot of breaks since then. None good. I got up and took another turn around the park. It was a warm evening, and the mosquitoes were out. I caught a whiff of frying hamburger from the elite cafe down the street. It reminded me that I hadn't eaten lately. There were lights on at the commercial hotel and one in the ticket office at the station. The local police force was still sitting on a stool at the Rexall, talking to the counter girl. I could see the thirty-eight revolver hanging down in a worn leather holster at his hip. All of a sudden, I was in a hurry to get it over with. I took another look at the lights. All the stores were dark now. There was nothing to wait for. I crossed the street, sauntered past the cigar store. There were dusty boxes of stogies in the window, and piles of homemade fudge stacked on plates with paper doilies under them. Behind them, the interior of the store looked grim and dead. I looked around, then turned down the side street toward the back door. A black sedan eased around the corner and pulled into the curb. A face leaned over to look at me through lenses like the bottom of Tabasco bottles. The hot evening air stirred, and I felt my damp shirt cold against my back. "'Looking for anything in particular, mister?' the cop said. I just looked at him. "'Passing through town, are you?' he asked. For some reason, I shook my head. "'I've got a job here,' I said. "'I'm going to work for Mr. Foster.' "'What, Mr. Foster?' The cop's voice was wheezy, but relentless. 
a voice used to asking questions. I remembered the ad, something about an adventure. Foster, Box 19. The cop was still staring at me. Box 19, I said. He looked me over some more, then reached across and opened the door. Better come on down to the station house with me, mister, he said. At police headquarters, the cop motioned me to a chair, sat down behind a desk, and pulled a phone to him. He dialed slowly, then swiveled his back to me to talk. Insects danced around the bare light bulb. There was an odor of leather and unwashed bedding. I sat and listened to a radio in the distance wailing a sad song. It was half an hour before I heard a car pull up outside. The man who came through the door was wearing a light suit that was neither new nor freshly pressed but had that look of perfect fit and taste that only the most expensive tailoring can achieve. He moved in a relaxed way, but gave an impression of power held in reserve. At first glance, I thought he was in his middle thirties, but when he looked my way, I saw the fine lines around the blue eyes. I got to my feet. He came over to me. I'm Foster, he said, and held out his hand. I shook it. My name is Legion, I said. The desk sergeant spoke up. This fellow says he came here to Mayport to see you, Mr. Foster. Foster looked at me steadily. That's right, sergeant. This gentleman is considering a proposition I've made. Well, I didn't know, Mr. Foster, the cop said. I quite understand, sergeant, Foster said. We all feel better knowing you're on the job. Well, you know, the cop said. We may as well be on our way, then. Foster said. If you're ready, Mr. Legion? Sure, I'm ready, I said. Mr. Foster said good night to the cop, and we went out. On the pavement in front of the building, I stopped. Thanks, Mr. Foster, I said. I'll comb myself out of your hair now. Foster had his hand on the door of a deceptively modest-looking cabriolet. I could smell the solid leather upholstery from where I stood. Why not come along to my place, Legion? he said. We might at least discuss my proposition. I shook my head. I'm not the man for the job, Mr. Foster, I said. If you'd like to advance me a couple of bucks, I'll get myself a bite to eat and fade right out of your life. What makes you so sure you're not interested? Your ad said something about adventure. I've had my adventures. Now I'm just looking for a hole to crawl into. I don't believe you, Legion. Foster smiled at me, a slow, calm smile. I think your adventures have hardly begun. I thought about it. If I went along, I'd at least get a meal, and maybe even a bed for the night. It was better than curling up under a tree. Well, I said, a remark like that demands time for an explanation. I got into the car and sank back in a seat that seemed to fit me the way Foster's jacket fit him. I hope you don't mind if I drive fast, Foster said. I want to be home before dark. We started up and wheeled away from the curb like a torpedo sliding out of the launching tube. I got out of the car in a drive at Foster's house and looked around at the wide clipped lawn, the flower beds that were vivid even by moonlight, the line of tall poplars, and the big white house. I wish I hadn't come, I said. This kind of place reminds me of all the things I haven't gotten out of life. Your life's still ahead of you, Foster said. He opened the slab of mahogany that was the front door, and I followed him inside. At the end of a short hall, he flipped a switch that flooded the room before us with soft light. I stared at an expanse of pale gray carpet about the size of a tennis court, on which rested glowing Danish teak furniture upholstered in rich colors. The walls were a rough textured gray. Here and there were expensively framed abstractions. The air was cool with the heavy coolness of air conditioning. Foster crossed to a bar that looked modest in this setting, in spite of being bigger than those in most of the places I'd seen lately. "'Would you care for a drink?' he said. I looked down at my limp, stained suit and grimy cuffs. Look, Mr. Foster, I said, I just realized something. If you've got a stable, I'll go sleep in it. Foster laughed. Ha! Come on, I'll show you the bath. 
I came downstairs clean showered and wearing a set of Foster's clothes. I found him sitting, sipping a drink, and listening to music. The Liebestadt, I said. A little gloomy, isn't it? I read something else into it, Foster said. Sit down and have a bite to eat and a drink. I sat in one of the big soft chairs and tried not to let my hand shake as I reached for one of the sandwiches piled on the coffee table. Tell me something, Mr. Legion, Foster said. Why did you come here, mention my name, if you didn't intend to see me? I shook my head. It just worked out that way. Tell me something about yourself, Foster said. It's not much of a story. Still, I'd like to hear it. Well, I was born, grew up, went to school. What school? University of Illinois. What was your major? Music. Foster looked at me, frowning slightly. It's the truth, I said. I wanted to be a conductor. The Army had other ideas. I was in my last year when the draft got me. They discovered I had what they considered an aptitude for intelligence work. I didn't mind it. I had a pretty good time for a couple of years. Go on, Foster said. Well, I'd had a bath and a good meal. I owed him something. If he wanted to hear my troubles, why not tell him? I was putting on a demonstration. A defective timer set off a charge of HE-50 seconds early on a one-minute setting. A student was killed. I got off easy with a busted eardrum and a pound or two of gravel embedded in my back. When I got out of the hospital, the Army felt real bad about letting me go. But they did. My terminal leave pay gave me a big weekend in San Francisco and set me up in business as a private investigator. I had enough left over after the bankruptcy proceedings a few months later to get me to Las Vegas. I lost what was left and took a job with a casino operator named Janino. I stayed with Janino for nearly a year. Then one night, a visiting bank clerk lost his head and shot him eight times with a twenty-two target pistol. I left town the same night. After that, I sold used cars for a couple of months in Memphis. Then I made like a lifeguard at Daytona, baited hooks on a thirty-foot tuna boat out of Key West. All the odd jobs with low pay and no future. I spent a couple of years in Cuba. All I got out of that was two bullet scars on the left leg and a prominent position on a CIA blacklist. After that, things got tough. A man of my trade can't really hope to succeed in a big way without the little blue card in the plastic cover to back his play. I was headed south for the winter, and I picked Mayport to run out of money. I stood up. I sure enjoyed the bath, Mr. Foster, and the meal, too. I'd like real well to get into that bed upstairs and have a night's sleep just to make it complete, but I'm not interested in the job. I turned away and started across the room. Legion, Foster said. I turned. A beer bottle was hanging in the air in front of my face. I put a hand up fast, and the bottle slapped my palm. Not a bad set of reflexes for a man whose adventures are all behind him, Foster said. I tossed the bottle aside. If I'd missed, that would have knocked my teeth out, I said angrily. You didn't miss, even though you're weaving a little from the beer. And a man who can feel a pint or so of beer isn't an alcoholic, so you're clean on that score. I didn't say I was ready for the rummy ward, I said. I'm just not interested in your proposition, whatever it is. Legion, Foster said. Maybe you have the idea that I put that ad in the paper last week, on a whim. The fact is, I've been running it, in one form or another, for over eight years. I looked at him and waited. Not only locally. I've run it in the big city papers, and in some of the national weekly and monthly publications. Altogether, I've had perhaps fifty responses. Foster smiled wryly. About three-quarters of them were from women who thought I wanted a playmate. Several more were from men with the same idea. The few others were hopelessly unsuitable. That's surprising, I said. I'd have thought you'd have brought half the nuts in the country out of the woodwork by now. Foster looked at me, not smiling. 
I realized suddenly that behind the urbane façade there was a hint of tension, a trace of worry in the level blue eyes. I'd like very much to interest you in what I have to say, Legion. I think you lack only one thing, confidence in yourself. I laughed shortly. <laughs> what other qualifications you think I have? I'm a jack of no trades. Legion, you're a man of considerable intelligence, and more than a little culture. You've traveled widely, and know how to handle yourself in difficult situations, or you wouldn't have survived. I'm sure your training includes techniques of entry and fact-gathering not known to the average man, and perhaps most important, although you're an honest man, you're capable of breaking the law, when necessary. So that's it, I said. No, I'm not forming a mob, Legion. As I said in the ad, this is an unusual adventure. It may, probably will, involve infringing various statutes and regulations of one sort or another. After you know the full story, I'll leave you to judge whether it's justifiable. If Foster was trying to arouse my curiosity, he was succeeding. He was dead serious about whatever it was he was planning. It sounded like something no one with good sense would want to get involved in. But on the other hand, Foster didn't look like the sort of man to do anything foolish. Why don't you tell me what this is all about? I said. Why would a man with all this, I waved a hand at the luxurious room, want to pick a hobo like me out of the gutter and talk him into taking a job? Your ego has taken a severe beating, Legion. That's obvious. I think you're afraid that I'll expect too much of you, or that I'll be shocked by some disclosure you may make. Perhaps if you'd forget yourself and your problems for the moment, we could reach an understanding. Yeah, I said. Just forget my problems. Chiefly money problems, of course. Most of the problems in this society involve the abstraction of values that money represents. Okay, I said. I've got my problems. You've got yours. Let's leave it at that. You feel that because I have material comfort, my problems must of necessity be trivial ones, Foster said. Tell me, Mr. Legion, have you ever known a man who suffered from amnesia? Foster crossed the room to a small writing desk, took something from a drawer, then looked at me. I'd like you to examine this, he said. I went over and took the object from his hand. It was a small book with a cover of drab-colored plastic, unornamented except for an embossed design of two concentric rings. I opened the cover. The pages were as thin as tissue, but opaque, and covered with extremely fine writing in strange foreign characters. The last dozen pages were in English. I had to hold the book close to my eyes to read the minute script. January 19th, 1710 Having come nigh to calamity with the near loss of the key, I will henceforth keep this journal in the English tongue. If this is an explanation of something, it's too subtle for me, I said. Legion, how old would you say I am? That's a hard one, I said. When I first saw you, I would have said the late thirties, maybe. Now, frankly, you look closer to fifty. I can show you proof, Foster said, that I spent the better part of a year in a military hospital in France. I awakened in a ward, bandaged to the eyes, and with no memories whatever of my life before that day. According to the records made at the time, I appeared to be about thirty years of age. Well, I said, amnesia is not so unusual among war casualties, and you seem to have done pretty well since. Foster shook his head impatiently. There is nothing difficult about acquiring material wealth in this society, though the effort kept me well occupied for a number of years, and diverted my thoughts from the question of my past life. The time came, however, when I had the leisure to pursue the matter. The clues I had were meager enough. The notebook I've shown you was found near me, and I had a ring on my finger. Foster held out his hand. 
On the middle finger was a massive signet, engraved with the same design of concentric circles I had seen on the cover of the notebook. I was badly burned. My clothing was charred. Oddly enough, the notebook was quite unharmed, though it was found among burned debris. It's made of very tough stuff. What did you find out? In a word, nothing. No military unit claimed me. I spoke English, from which it was deduced that I was English or American. They couldn't tell which from your accent? Apparently not. It appears I spoke a sort of hybrid dialect. Maybe you're lucky. I'd be happy to forget my first thirty years. I spent a considerable sum of money in my attempts to discover my past, Foster went on. And several years of time. In the end, I gave it up. And it wasn't until then that I found the first faint inkling. So you did find something, I said. Nothing I hadn't had all along. The notebook. I'd have thought you would have read that before you did anything else, I said. Don't tell me you put it in the bureau drawer and forgot it. I read it, of course. What I could read of it. Only a relatively small section is in English. The rest is a cipher. And what I read seemed meaningless, quite unrelated to me. You've glanced through it. It's no more than a journal, irregularly kept, and so cryptic as to be little better than a code itself. And, of course, the dates. They range from the early 18th century through the early 20th. A sort of family record, maybe, I said, carried on generation after generation. Didn't it mention any names or places? Look at it again, Legion, Foster said. See if you notice anything odd, other than what we've already discussed. I thumbed through the book again. It was no more than an inch thick, but it was heavy, surprisingly heavy. There were a lot of pages. I shuffled through hundreds of closely written sheets, and yet the book was less than half used. I read bits here and there. May 4th, 1746. The voyage was not a success. I must forsake this avenue of inquiry. October 23rd, 1790. Builded the west barrier a cubit higher. Now the fires burn every night. Is there no limit to their infernal persistence? January 19th, 1831. I have great hopes for the Philadelphia enterprise. My greatest foe is impatience. All preparations for the change are made. Yet, I confess, I am uneasy. There are plenty of oddities, I said, aside from the entries themselves. This is supposed to be old, but the quality of the paper and binding beats anything I've seen, and that handwriting is pretty fancy for a quill pen. There's a stylus clipped to the spine of the book, Foster said. It was written with that. I looked, pulled out a slim pen, then looked at Foster. Speaking of odd, I said, a genuine antique early colonial ballpoint pen doesn't turn up every day. Suspend your judgment until you've seen it all, Foster said. And two hundred years on one refill. That's not bad. I riffled through the pages, then I tossed the book onto the table. Who's kidding who, Foster? I said. The book was described in detail in the official record, of which I have copies. They mention the paper and binding, the stylus, even quote some of the entries. The authorities worked over it pretty closely, trying to identify me. They reached the same conclusion as you, that it was the work of a crackpot. But they saw the same book you're looking at now. So what? It was faked up some time during the war. What does that prove? I'm ready to concede it's forty years old. You don't understand, Legion, Foster said. I told you I woke up in a military hospital in France. But it was an AEF hospital, and the year was 1918. End of chapter 1《Chapter Two of A Trace of Memory》by Keith Laumer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. I glanced sideways at Foster. 
He didn't look like a nut. All I've got to say is, I said, you're a hell of a spry-looking ninety. You find my appearance strangely youthful. What would be your reaction if I told you that I've aged greatly in the past few months? That a year ago I could have passed as no older than thirty without the slightest difficulty. I don't think I'd believe you, I said, and I'm sorry, Mr. Foster, but I don't believe the bit about the 1918 hospital either. How can I? It's... I know, fantastic. But let's go back a moment to the book itself. Look closely at the paper. It's been examined by experts. They're baffled by it. Attempts to analyze it chemically failed. They were unable to take a sample. It's impervious to solvents. They couldn't get a sample, I said. Why not just tear off the corner of one of the sheets? Try it, Foster said. I picked up the book and plucked at the edge of one of the blank sheets, then pinched harder and pulled. The paper held. I got a better grip and pulled again. It was like fine, tough leather, except that it didn't even stretch. It's tough, all right, I said. I took out my pocket knife and opened it and worked on the edge of the paper. Nothing. I went over to the bureau and put the paper flat against the top and sawed at it, putting my weight on the knife. I raised the knife and brought it down hard. I didn't so much as mark the sheet. I put the knife away. That's some paper, Mr. Foster. Try to tear the binding, Foster said. Put a match to it. Shoot at it, if you like. Nothing will make an impression on that material. Now, you're a logical man, Legion. Is there something here outside ordinary experience, or is there not? I sat down, feeling for a cigarette I still didn't have. What does it prove? I said. Only that the book is not a simple fraud. You're facing something which can't be dismissed as fancy. The book exists. That is our basic point of departure. Where do we go from there? There is a second factor to be considered, Foster went on. At some time in the past, I seem to have made an enemy. Someone, or something, is systematically hunting me. I try to laugh, but it felt out of place. Why not sit and let it catch up with you? Maybe it could tell you what the whole thing is about. Foster shook his head. It started almost thirty years ago, he said. I was driving south from Albany, New York, at night. It was a long, straight stretch of road, no houses. I noticed lights following me. Not headlights, something that bobbed along, off in the fields, along the road. But they kept pace, gradually moving alongside. Then they closed in ahead, keeping out of range of my headlights. I stopped the car. I wasn't seriously alarmed, just curious. I wanted a better look, so I switched on my spotlight and played it on the lights. They disappeared as the light touched them. After half a dozen were gone, the rest began closing in. I kept picking them off. There was a sound, too. A sort of high-pitched humming. I caught a whiff of sulfur then, and suddenly I was afraid, deathly afraid. I caught the last one in the beam no more than ten feet from the car. I can't describe the horror of the moment. It sounds pretty weird, I said. But what was there to be afraid of? There must have been some kind of heat lightning. There is always the pat explanation, Foster said. But no explanation can rationalize the instinctive dread I felt. I started up the car and drove on, right through the night and the next day. I sensed that I must put distance between myself and whatever it was I had met. I bought a home in California and tried to put the incident out of my mind, with limited success. Then it happened again. The same thing? Lights? It was more sophisticated the next time. It started with interference, static, on my radio. Then it affected the wiring in the house. All the lights began to glow weakly even though they were switched off. I could feel it, feel it in my bones, moving closer, hemming me in. I tried the car. It wouldn't start. Fortunately, I kept a few horses at that time. I mounted and rode into town, at a fair gallop, you may be sure. I saw the lights, but outdistanced them. 
I caught a train and kept going. I don't see... It happened again, four times in all. I thought perhaps I had succeeded in eluding it at last. I was mistaken. I have had definite indications that my time here is drawing to a close. I would have been gone before now, but there were certain arrangements to be made. Look, I said, this is all wrong. You need a psychiatrist, not an ex-tough guy. Delusions of persecution. It seemed obvious that the explanation was to be found somewhere in my past life, Foster went on. I turned to the notebook, my only link. I copied it out, including the encrypted portion. I had photostatic enlargements made of the initial section, the part written in unfamiliar characters. None of the experts who have examined the script have been able to identify it. I necessarily, therefore, concentrated my attention on the last section, the only part written in English. I was immediately struck by a curious fact I had ignored before. The writer made references to an enemy, a mysterious they, against which defensive measures had to be taken. Maybe that's where you got the idea, I said, when you first read the book. The writer of the log, Foster said, was dogged by the same nemesis that now follows me. It doesn't make any sense, I said. For the moment, Foster said, stop looking for logic in this situation. Look for a pattern instead. There's a pattern, all right, I said. The next thing that struck me, Foster went on, was a reference to a loss of memory, a second point of some familiarity to me. The writer expresses frustration at the inability to remember certain facts which would have been useful to him in his pursuit. What kind of pursuit? Some sort of scientific project, as nearly as I can gather. The journal bristles with tantalizing references to matters that are never explained. And you think the man that wrote it had amnesia? Not exactly amnesia, perhaps, Foster said. But there were things he was unable to remember. If that's amnesia, we've all got it, I said. Nobody's got a perfect memory. But these were matters of importance, not the kinds of things that simply slip one's minds. I can see how you'd want to believe that the book had something to do with your past, Mr. Foster. It must be a hard thing not knowing your own life story. But you're on the wrong track. Maybe the book is a story you started to write in code, so nobody would accidentally read the stuff and kid you about it. Legion, what was it you planned to do when you got to Miami? The question caught me a little off guard. Well, I don't know, I hedged. I wanted to get south where it's warm. I used to know a few people. In other words, nothing, Foster said. Legion, I'll pay you well to stay with me and see this thing through. I shook my head. Not me, Mr. Foster. The whole thing sounds, well, the kindest word I can think of is nutty. Legion, Foster said, do you really believe I'm insane? Let's just say this all seems a little screwy to me, Mr. Foster. I'm not asking you just to work for me, Foster said. I'm asking for your help. You might as well look for your fortune in tea leaves, I said, irritated. There's nothing in what you've told me. There's more, Legion, much more. I've recently made an important discovery. When I know you're with me, I'll tell you. You know enough now to accept the fact that this isn't entirely a figment of my imagination. I don't know anything, I said. So far, it's all talk. If you're concerned about payment... No, damn it, I barked. Where are the papers you keep talking about? I gotta have my head examined for sitting here humoring you. I've had troubles enough. I stopped talking and rubbed my hands over my scalp. I'm sorry, Mr. Foster, I said. I guess what's really griping me is that you've got everything I think I want and you're not content with it. It bothers me to see you off chasing fairies. If a man with his health and plenty of money can't enjoy life, what the hell is there for anybody? Foster looked at me thoughtfully. Legion, 
If you could have anything in life you wanted, what would you ask for? Anything? I've wanted a lot of different things. Once I wanted to be a hero. Later I wanted to be smart, know all the answers. Then I had the idea that a chance to do an honest job, one that needed doing, was the big thing. I never found that job. I never got smart either, or figured out how to tell a hero from a coward without a program. In other words, Foster said, you were looking for an abstraction to believe in. In this case, justice. But you won't find justice in nature. It's a thing that only man expects or acknowledges. There are some good things in life. I'd like to get a piece of them. Don't lose your capacity for dreaming in the process. Dreams? I said. Oh, I've got those. I want an island somewhere in the sun where I can spend my time fishing and watching the sea. You're speaking cynically, but you're still attempting to concretize an abstraction, Foster said. But no matter. Materialism is simply another form of idealism. I looked at Foster. But I know I'll never have those things, or that justice you were talking about, either. Once you really know you'll never make it, Perhaps unattainability is an essential element of any dream, Foster said. But hold on to your dream, whatever it is. Don't ever give it up. So much for philosophy, I said. Where is it getting us? You'd like to see the papers, Foster said. He fished a key ring from an inner pocket. If you don't mind going out to the car, he said, and perhaps getting your hands dirty, there's a strong box welded to the frame. I keep photostats of everything there, along with my passport, emergency funds, and so on. I've learned to be ready to travel on very short notice. Lift the floorboards. You'll see the box. It's not all that urgent, I said. I'll take a look in the morning, after I've caught up on some sleep. But don't get the wrong idea. It's just my knot-headed curiosity. Very well, Foster said. He laid back sighed. I'm tired, Legion, he said. My mind is tired. Yeah, I said, so is mine, not to mention other portions of my anatomy. Get some sleep, Foster said. We'll talk again in the morning. I pushed back the light blanket and slid out of bed. Underfoot, the rug was as thick and soft as a working girl's mink. I went across to the closet and pushed the button that made the door slide aside. My old clothes were still lying on the floor where I had left them, but I had the clean ones that Foster had lent me. He wouldn't mind if I borrowed them for a little while longer. It would be cheaper for him in the long run. Foster was as loony as a six-day bike racer, but there was no point in my waiting around to tell him so. The borrowed outfit didn't include a coat. I thought of putting my old jacket on, but it was warm outside, and a gray pinstripe with grease spots wouldn't help the picture any. I transferred my personal belongings from my grimy clothes on the floor and eased the door open. Downstairs, the curtains were drawn in the living room. I could vaguely make out the outline of the bar. It wouldn't hurt to take along a bite to eat. I groped my way behind the bar, felt along the shelves, found a stack of small cans that rattled softly. Nuts, probably. I reached to put a can on the bar, and it clattered against something I couldn't see. I swore silently, felt over the obstruction. It was bulky, with the cold smoothness of metal, and there were small projections with sharp corners. It felt for all the world like... I leaned over and squinted. With the faint gleam of moonlight from a chink in the heavy curtains falling just so, I could almost make out the shape. I crouched a little lower and caught the glint of light along the perforated jacket of a thirty caliber machine gun. My eye followed the barrel, made out the darker square of the entrance hall, and the tiny reflection of light off the polished brass doorknob at the far end. I stepped back, flattened against the wall with a hollow feeling inside. If I had tried to walk through that door... Foster was crazy enough for two ordinary nuts. My eyes flicked around the room. I had to get out quickly before he jumped out and said boo 
and I died of heart failure. The windows, maybe. I came around the end of the bar, got down, and crawled under the barrel of the gun and over to the heavy drapes, pushing them aside. Pale light glowed beyond the glass. Not the soft light of the moon, but a milky, churning glow that reminded me of the phosphorescence of seawater. I dropped the curtain, ducked back under the gun into the hall, and pushed through a swinging door into the kitchen. There was a faint glow from the luminous handle of the refrigerator. I yanked it open, spilling light on the floor, and looked around. Plenty of gleaming white fixtures, but no door out. There was a window, almost obscured by leaves. I eased it open, and almost broke my fist on a wrought iron trellis. Back in the hall, I tried two more doors, both locked. A third opened, and I found myself looking down the cellar stairs. They were steep and dark, as cellar stairs always seem to be, but they might be the way out. I felt for a light switch, flipped it on. A weak illumination showed me a patch of damp-looking floor at the foot of the steps. It still wasn't inviting, but I went down. There was an oil furnace in the center of the room, with dusty ductwork spidering out across the ceiling. Some heavy packing cases of rough wood were stacked along one wall, and at the far side of the room there was a boarded-up coal bin, but no cellar door. I turned to go back up. Then I heard a sound and froze. Somewhere a cockroach scuttled briefly. Then I heard the sound again, a faint grinding of stone against stone. I peered through the cobwebbed shadows, my mouth suddenly dry. There was nothing. The thing for me to do was to get up the stairs fast, batter the iron trellis out of the kitchen window, and run like hell. The trouble was I had to move to do it and the sound of my own steps was so loud it was paralyzing. Compared to this, the shock of stumbling over the gun was just a mild kick, like finding a whistle in your Cracker Jacks. Ordinarily, I didn't believe in things that went bump in the night, but this time I was hearing the bumps myself, and all I could think about was Edgar Allan Poe and his cheery tales about people who got themselves buried before they were thoroughly dead. There was another sound. Then a sharp snap, and I saw a light spring up from a crack that opened across the floor in the shadowy corner. That was enough for me. I jumped for the stairs, took them three at a time, and banged through the kitchen door. I grabbed up a chair, swung it around, and slammed it against the trellis. It bounced back and cracked me across the mouth. I dropped it, tasting blood. Maybe that was what I needed. The panic faded before a stronger emotion anger. I turned and barged along the dark hall to the living room, and lights suddenly went on. I whirled and saw Foster standing in the hall doorway, fully dressed. Okay, Foster, I yelled. Just show me the way out of here. Foster held my eyes, his face tense. Calm yourself, Mr. Legion, he said softly. What's happened here? Get over there to that gun, I snapped, nodding towards the thirty caliber on the bar. Disarm it, and then get the front door open. I'm leaving. Foster's eyes flicked over the clothes I was wearing. So I see, he said. He looked me in the face again. What is it that's frightened you, Legion? Don't act so innocent, I said. Or am I supposed to get the idea the brownies set up the booby trap while you were asleep? His eyes went to the gun, and his expression tightened. It's mine, he said. It's an automatic arrangement. Something's activated it, and without sounding my alarm. You haven't been outside, have you? How could I? This is important, Legion, Foster rapped. It would take more than the sight of a machine gun to panic you. What have you seen? I was looking for a back door, I said. I went down to the cellar. I didn't like it down there, so I came back up. What did you see in the cellar? Foster's face looked strained, colorless. It looked like... I hesitated. There was a crack in the floor. Noises. Lights. The floor, Foster said. Certainly. That's the weak point. He seemed to be talking to himself. I jerked a thumb over my shoulder. Something funny going on outside your windows, too. Foster looked toward the heavy hangings. 
Listen carefully, Legion, he said. We are in grave danger, both of us. It's fortunate you arose when you did. This house, as you must have guessed by now, is something of a fortress. At this moment it is under attack. The walls are protected by some rather formidable defenses. I can't say as much for the cellar floor. It's merely three feet of ferro-concrete. We'll have to go now, very swiftly and very quietly. Okay, show me, I said. Foster turned and went back along the hall to one of the locked doors, where he pressed something. The door opened, and I followed him inside a small room. He crossed to a blank wall, pressed against it. A panel slid aside, and Foster jumped back. "'God's wounds!' he gasped. He threw himself at the wall, and the panel closed. I stood stock still. From somewhere there was a smell like sulfur. "'What the hell goes on?' I said. My voice cracked, as it always does when I'm scared. "'That odor,' Foster said. "'Quickly, the other way!' I stepped back, and Foster pushed past me and ran along the hall, with me at his heels. I didn't look back to see what was at my own heels. Foster took the stairs three at a time, pulled up short on the landing. He went to his knees, shoved back an Ishfahan rug, a supple as sable, and gripped a steel ring set in the floor. He looked at me, his face white. "'Invoke thy gods,' he said hoarsely, and heaved at the ring. A section of floor swung up, showing the first step of a flight leading down into a black hole. Foster didn't hesitate. He dropped his feet in, scrambled down. I followed. The stairs went down about ten feet, ending on a stone floor. There was the sound of a latch turning, and we stepped out into a larger room. I saw moonlight through a row of high windows and smelled the fragrance of fresh night air. "'We're in the garage,' Foster whispered. Go around to the other side of the car and get in, quietly. I touched the smooth flank of the rakish cabriolet, found my way around it, and eased the door open. I slipped into the seat and closed the door gently. Beside me, Foster touched a button and a green light glowed on the dash. Ready? he said. Sure. The starter whined half a turn and the engine caught. Without waiting, Foster gunned it, let in the clutch. The car leaped for the closed doors, and I ducked, and then saw the doors snap aside as the low-slung car roared out into the night. We took the first turn in the drive at forty and rounded onto the highway at sixty, tires screaming. I took a look back and caught a glimpse of the house, its stately façade white in the moonlight, and then we were out of sight over a rise. "'What's it all about?' I called over the rush of air. The needle touched ninety, kept going. Later, Foster barked. I didn't feel like arguing. I watched in the mirror for a few minutes, wondering where all the cops were tonight. Then I settled down in the padded seat and watched the speedometer eat up the miles. End of Chapter 2 Chapter 3 of A Trace of Memory by Keith Laumer This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. It was nearly four-thirty, and a tentative gray streak showed through the palm fronds to the east before I broke the silence. "'By the way,' I said, "'what was the routine with the steel shutters, and the bulletproof glass in the kitchen, and the handy home-model machine-gun covering the front door? Mice bad around the place, are they?' "'Those things were necessary, and more.' "'Now that the short hairs along my spine have relaxed,' I said, the whole thing looks pretty silly. We've run far enough now to be able to stop and turn around and stick our tongues out. Not yet. Not for a long while yet. Why don't we just go back home? I went on. And no, Foster said sharply. I want your word on that, Legion, no matter what. Don't ever go near that house again. It'll be daylight soon, I said. We'll feel pretty asinine about this little trip after the sun comes up. But don't worry. I won't tell anybody. We've got to keep moving, Foster said. At the next town, I'll telephone for seats on a flight out of Miami. Hold on, I said. You're raving. What about your house? We didn't even stick around long enough to make sure the TV was turned off. And what about passports and money and luggage? And what makes you think I'm going with you? I've kept myself in readiness for this emergency. 
Foster said. There are disposition instructions for the house on file with a legal firm in Jacksonville. There is nothing to connect me with my former life, once I've changed my name and disappeared. As for the rest, we can buy luggage in the morning. My passport is in the car. Perhaps we'd better go first to Puerto Rico until we can arrange for one for you. Look, I said, I got spooked in the dark, that's all. Why not just admit we made fools of ourselves? Foster shook his head. The inherent inertia of the human mind, he said, how it fights to resist new ideas. The kind of new ideas you're talking about could get both of us locked up in a chuckle ward, I said. Legion, Foster said, I think you'd better write down what I'm going to tell you. It's important, vitally important. I won't waste time with preliminaries. The notebook I showed you, it's in my jacket. You must read the English portion of it. Afterwards, what I'm about to say may make more sense. I hope you don't feel your last will and testament coming on, Mr. Foster, I said. Not before you tell me what that was we were both so eager to get away from. I'll be frank with you, Foster said flatly. I don't know. Foster wheeled into the dark drive of a silent service station, eased to a stop, set the brake, and slumped back in the seat. Do you mind driving for a while, Legion? he said. I'm not feeling very well. Sure, I'll drive, I said. I opened the door, got out, and went around to his side. Foster sat limply, eyes closed, his face drawn and strained. He looked older than he had last night, years older. The night's experience hadn't taken anything off my age, either. Foster opened his eyes, looked at me blankly. He seemed to gather himself with an effort. I'm sorry, he said. I'm not myself. He moved over, and I got in the driver's seat. If you're sick, I said, we'd better find a doctor. No, it's all right, he said blurrily. Just keep going. We're a hundred and fifty miles from Mayport now, I said. Foster turned to me, started to say something, and slumped in a dead faint. I grabbed for his pulse. It was strong and steady. I rolled up an eyelid and a dilated pupil stared sightlessly. He was all right, I hoped. But the thing to do was get him in bed and call a doctor. We were at the edge of a small town. I let the brake off and drove slowly into town, swung round a corner, and pulled up in front of the sagging marquee of a rundown hotel. Foster stirred as I cut the engine. Foster, I said, I'm going to get you into a bed. Can you walk? He groaned softly and opened his eyes. They were glassy. I got out and got him to the sidewalk. He was still half out. I walked him into the dingy lobby and over to a reception counter where a dim bulb burned. I dinged the bell. It was a minute before an old man shuffled out from where he'd been sleeping. He yawned, eyed me suspiciously, looked at Foster. We don't want no drunks here, he said. Respectable house. My friend is sick, I said. Give me a double with bath and call a doctor. What's he got? the old man said. Ain't contagious, is it? That's what I want a doctor to tell me. I can't get the doc for in the morning. And we got no private bathrooms. I signed the register. We rode the open cage elevator to the fourth floor, went along a gloomy hall to a door painted a peeling brown. It didn't look inviting. The room inside wasn't much better. There was a lot of flowered wallpaper and an old-fashioned washstand and two wide beds. I stretched Foster out on one. He lay relaxed, a serene expression on his face, the kind undertakers try for but never quite seem to manage. I sat down on the other bed and pulled off my shoes. It was my turn to have a tired mind. I lay on the bed and let it sink down like a gray stone into still water. I awoke from a dream in which I had just discovered the answer to the riddle of life. I tried to hold on to it, but it slipped away. It always does. Gray daylight was filtering through the dusty windows. Foster lay slackly on the broad, sagging bed, a ceiling lamp with a faded, fringed shade casting a sickly yellow light over him. It didn't make things any cheerier. 
I flipped it off. Foster was lying on his back, arms spread wide, breathing heavily. Maybe it was only exhaustion, and he didn't need a doctor after all. He'd probably wake up in a little while, raring to go. As for me, I was feeling hungry again. I'd have to have a buck or so for sandwiches. I went over to the bed and called Foster's name. He didn't move. If he was sleeping that soundly, maybe I wouldn't bother him. I eased his wallet out of his coat pocket, took it to the window, and checked it. It was fat. I took a ten, put the wallet on the table. I remembered Foster had said something about money in the car. I had the keys in my pocket. I got my shoes on and let myself out quietly. Foster hadn't moved. Down on the street, I waited for a couple of yokels who were looking over Foster's car to move on, then slid into the seat, leaned over, and got the floorboards up. The strong box was set into the channel of the frame. I scraped the road dirt off the lock and opened it with a key from Foster's key ring, took out the contents. There was a bundle of stiffish papers, a passport, some maps, marked up, and a wad of currency that made my mouth go dry. I riffled through it. Fifty grand if it was a buck. I stuffed the papers, money, and passport back in the box and locked it, and climbed out onto the sidewalk. A few doors down the street there was a dirty window lettered Mays Eat. I went in, ordered hamburgers and coffee to go and sat at the counter with Foster's keys in front of me, thinking about the car that went with them. The passport only needed a little work on the picture to get me wherever I wanted to go, and the money would buy me my choice of islands. Foster would have a nice long nap, and then take a train home. With his dough, he'd hardly miss what I took. The counterman put a paper bag in front of me, and I paid him and went out. I stood by the car, jingling the keys on my palm and thinking. I could be in Miami in an hour, and I knew where to go for the passport job. Foster was a nice guy, and I liked him, but I'd never have a break like this again. I reached for the car door, and a voice said, Paper, mister? I jumped and looked around. A dirty-faced kid was looking at me. Sure, I said. I gave him a single and took the paper, flipped it open. A Mayport dateline caught my eye. Police Raid Hideout A surprise raid by local police led to the discovery here today of a secret gangland fortress. Chief Chesters of the Mayport Police stated that the raid came as an aftermath of the arrival in the city yesterday of a notorious northern gang member. A number of firearms, including army-type machine guns, were seized in the raid on a house nine miles from Mayport on the Fernandia Road. The raid was said by Chief Chesters to be the culmination of a lengthy investigation. C. R. Foster, 50, owner of the property, is missing and feared dead. Police are seeking the ex-convict who visited the house last night. It is feared that Foster may have been the victim of a gangland murder. I banged through the door to the darkened room and stopped short. In the gloom, I could see Foster sitting on the edge of the bed, looking my way. Look at this, I yelped, flapping the paper in his face. Now the cops are dragging the state for me, and on a murder rap at that. Get on the phone and get this thing straightened out, if you can. You and your little green men. The cops think they've stumbled on Al Capone's arsenal. You'll have fun explaining that one. Foster looked at me interestedly. He smiled. What's funny about it, Foster? I yelled. Your dough may buy you out, but what about me? Forgive me for asking, Foster said pleasantly. But who are you? There are times when I'm slow on the uptake, but this wasn't one of them. The implications of what Foster had said hit me hard enough to make my knees go weak. Oh no, Mr. Foster, I said. You can't lose your memory again. Not right now. Not with the police looking for me. You're my alibi. You're the one that has to explain all the business about the guns and the ad in the paper. I just came to see you about a job, remember? My voice was getting a little shrill. Foster sat looking at me, wearing an expression between a frown and a smile, like a credit manager turning down an application. 
He shook his head slightly. My name is not Foster. Look, I said. Your name was Foster yesterday. That's all I care about. You're the one that owns the house the cops are all upset about, and you're the corpse I'm supposed to have knocked off. You've got to go to the cops with me, right now, and tell them I'm just an innocent bystander. I went to the window and raised the shades to let some light into the room. Turned back to Foster. I'll explain to the cops about you thinking the little men were after you. I stopped talking and stared at Foster. For a wild moment, I thought I'd made a mistake, that I'd wandered into the wrong room. I knew Foster's face all right. The light was bright enough now to see clearly, but the man I was talking to couldn't have been a day over twenty years old. I went close to him, staring hard. There were the same cool blue eyes, but the lines around them were gone. The black hair grew lower and thicker than I remembered it, and the skin was clear. I sat down hard on my bed. Mamma mia, I said. Que es la dificultad, Foster said. Shut up, I moaned. I'm confused enough in one language. I was trying hard to think, but I couldn't seem to get started. A few minutes earlier, I'd had the world by the tail, just before it turned around and bit me. Cold sweat popped out on my forehead when I thought about how close I had come to driving off in Foster's car. Every cop in the state would be looking for it by now, and if they found me in it, the jury wouldn't be out ten minutes reaching a verdict of guilty. Then another thought hit me, the kind that brings you bolt upright with your teeth clenched and your heart hammering. It wouldn't be long before the local hick cops would notice the car out front. They'd come in after me, and I'd tell them it belonged to Foster. They'd take a look at him and say, Nuts! The bird we want is fifty years old. And where did you hide the body? I got up and started pacing. Foster had already told me there was nothing to connect him with his house in Mayport. The locals there had seen enough of him to know he was pushing middle age, at least. I could kick and scream and tell them this twenty-year-old kid was Foster, but I'd never make it stick. There was no way to prove my story. They'd figure Foster was dead and that I'd killed him. And anybody who thinks you need a corpus to prove murder better read his Perry Mason again. I glanced out of the window and did a double-take. Two cops were standing by Foster's car. One of them went around to the back and got out a pad and took down the license number, then said something over his shoulder and started across the street. The second cop planted himself by the car, his eye on the front of the hotel. I whirled on Foster. Get your shoes on, I croaked. Let's get the hell out of here. We went down the stairs quietly and found a back door opening on an alley. Nobody saw us go. An hour later, I sagged in a grimy coach seat and studied Foster, sitting across from me. A middle-aged nut with the face of a young kid and a mind like a blank slate. I had no choice but to drag him with me. My only chance was to stick close and hope he got back enough of his memory to get me off the hook. It was time for me to be figuring my next move. I thought about the fifty thousand dollars I had left behind in the car and groaned. Foster looked concerned. Are you in pain? he said. And how I'm in pain, I said. Before I met you, I was a homeless bum, broke and hungry. Now I can add a couple more items. The cops are after me, and I've got a mental case to nurse maid. What law have you broken? Foster said. None, I barked. As a crook, I'm a washout. I've planned three larcenies in the last twelve hours, and flunked out on all of them. And now I'm wanted for murder. Whom did you kill? Foster inquired courteously. I leaned across so I could snarl in his face. You! Then, get this through your head, Foster. The only crime I'm guilty of is stupidity. I listened to your crazy story. Because of you, I'm in a mess I'll never get straightened out. I leaned back. And then there's the question of old men that take a nap and wake up in their late teens. We'll go into that later, after I've had my nervous breakdown. I'm sorry if I've been the cause of difficulty, Foster said. I wish that I could recall the things you've spoken of. 
Is there anything I can do to assist you now? And you were the one who wanted help, I said. There is one thing. Let me have the money you've got on you. We'll need it. Foster got out his wallet, after I told him where it was, and handed it to me. I looked through it. There was nothing in it with a photo or fingerprints. When Foster said he had arranged matters so that he could disappear without a trace, he hadn't been kidding. We'll go to Miami, I said. I know a place in the Cuban section where we can lie low, cheap. Maybe if we wait a while, you'll start remembering things. Yes, Foster said. That would be pleasant. You haven't forgotten how to talk, at least, I said. I wonder what else you can do. Do you remember how you made all that money? I can remember nothing of your economic system, Foster said. He looked around. This is a very primitive world in many respects, he said. It should not be difficult to amass wealth here. I never had much luck at it, I said. I haven't even been able to amass the price of a meal. Food is exchanged for money? Foster asked. Everything is exchanged for money, I said, including most of the human virtues. This is a strange world, Foster said. It will take me a long while to become accustomed to it. Yeah, me too, I said. Maybe things would be better on Mars. Foster nodded. Perhaps, he said. Perhaps we should go there. I groaned, then caught myself. No, I'm not in pain, I said. But don't take me so literally, Foster. We rode along in silence for a while. Say, Foster, I said. Have you still got that notebook of yours? Foster tried several pockets, came up with the book. He looked at it, turned it over, frowning. You remember it? I said, watching him. He shook his head slowly, then ran his finger around the circles embossed on the cover. This pattern, he said, it signifies... Go on, Foster, I said. Signifies what? I'm sorry, he said. I don't remember. I took the book and sat looking at it. I really didn't see it, though. I was seeing my future. When Foster didn't turn up, they'd naturally assume he was dead. I'd been with him just before his disappearance. It wasn't hard to see why they'd want to talk to me. And my having vanished, too, wouldn't help any. My picture would blossom out in post offices all over the country. And even if they didn't catch me right away, the murder charge would always be there, hanging over me. It wouldn't do any good to turn myself in and tell them the whole story. They wouldn't believe me, and I wouldn't blame them. I didn't really believe it myself, and I'd live through it. But then, maybe I was just imagining that Foster looked younger. After all, a good night's rest. I looked at Foster and almost groaned again. Twenty was stretching it. Eighteen was more like it. I was willing to swear he'd never shaved in his life. Foster, I said, it's got to be in this book, who you are, where you came from. It's the only hope I've got. I suggest we read it, then, Foster said. A bright idea, I said. Why didn't I think of that? I thumbed through the book to the section in English and read for an hour. Starting with the entry dated January 19, 1710, the writer had scribbled a few lines every few months. He seemed to be some kind of pioneer in the Virginia colony. He complained about prices and the Indians and the ignorance of the other settlers, and every now and then he threw in a remark about the enemy. He often took long trips, and when he got home he complained about those, too. "'It's a funny thing, Foster,' I said. "'This is supposed to have been written over a period of a couple of hundred years,' But it's all in the same hand. It's kind of odd, isn't it? Why should a man's handwriting change? Foster said. Well, it might get a little shaky there toward the last, don't you agree? Why is that? I'll spell it out, Foster, I said. Most people don't live that long. A hundred years is stretching it, to say nothing of two. This must be a very violent world, then, Foster said. Skip it, I said. You talk like you're just visiting. By the way, do you remember how to write? Foster looked thoughtful. Yes, he said. I can write. I handed him the book and the stylus. Try it, I said. Foster opened to a blank page, wrote, 
and handed the book back to me. Always and always and always, I read. I looked at Foster. What does that mean? I looked at the words again, then quickly flipped to the pages written in English. I was no expert on penmanship, but this came up and cracked me right in the eye. The book was written in Foster's hand. It doesn't make sense, I was saying for the fortieth time. Foster nodded sympathetic agreement. Why would you write out this junk yourself and then spend all that time and money trying to have it deciphered? You said experts worked over it and couldn't break it. But, I went on, you must have known you wrote it. You knew your own handwriting. But on the other hand, you had amnesia before. You had the idea you might have told something about yourself in the book. I sighed, leaned back, and tossed the book over the foster. Here, you read a while, I said. I'm arguing with myself, and I can't tell who's winning. Foster looked the book over carefully. This is odd, he said. What's odd? The book is made of calf. It is a permanent material, and yet it shows damage. I sat perfectly still and waited. Here, on the back cover, Foster said. A scuffed area. Since this is calf, it cannot be an actual scar. It must have been placed there. I grabbed the book and looked. There was a faint mark across the back cover, as though the book had been scraped on something sharp. I remembered how much luck I had had with a knife. The mark had been put there, disguised as a casual nick in the finish. It had to mean something. How do you know what the material is? I asked. Foster looked surprised. In the same way that I know the window is of glass, he said. I simply know. Speaking of glass, I said, wait till I get my hands on a microscope. Then maybe we'll begin to get some answers. End of chapter 3「Chapter Four of A Trace of Memory by Keith Laumer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The two hundred pound senorita, with the wart on her upper lip, put a pot of black Cuban coffee and a pitcher of salted milk down beside the two chipped cups, leered at me in a way that might have been appealing thirty years before, and waddled back to the kitchen. I poured a cup, gulped half of it, and shuddered. In the street outside the café, a guitar cried, Estrelita. Okay, Foster, I said. Here's what I've got. The first half of the book is in pothooks. I can't read that. But this middle section, the part coded in regular letters, is actually encrypted English. It's a sort of resume of what happened. I picked up the sheets of paper on which I had transcribed my deciphering of the coded section of the book using the key that had been micro-engraved in the fake scratch on the back cover. I read, For the first time I am afraid. My attempt to construct the communicator called down the hunters upon me. I made such a shield as I could contrive, and sought their nesting place. I came there, and it was in that place that I knew of old, and it was no hive but a pit in the ground, built by men of the two worlds, and I would have come into it but the hunters swarmed in their multitudes. I fought them and killed many, but at last I fled away. I came to the western shore, and there I hired bold sailors and a poor craft, and set forth. In forty-nine days we came to shore in this wilderness, and there were men as from the dawn of time, and I fought them, and when they had learned fear I lived among them in peace, and the hunters have not found this place. Now it may be that my saga ends here, but I will do what I am able. The change may soon come upon me. I must prepare for the stranger who will come after me. All that he must know is in these pages, and I say to him, Have patience, for the time of this race draws close. Venture not again on the eastern continent, but wait, for soon the northern sailors must come in numbers into this wilderness. Seek out their cleverest metal workers, and, when it may be, devise a shield, and only then return to the pit of the hunters. It lies in the plain, fifty ten thousandths parts of the girth of this, to the west of the great chalk face, 
and 1,470 parts north from the median line, as I reckon. The stones mark it well with the sign of the two worlds. I looked across at Foster. It goes on then with a blow-by-blow -blow account of dealings with Aborigines. He was trying to get them civilized in a hurry. They figured he was a god, and he set them to work building roads and cutting stone and learning mathematics and so on. He was doing all he could to set things up so this stranger who was to follow him would know the score and carry on the good work. Foster's eyes were on my face. What is the nature of the change he speaks of? He never says. But I suppose he's talking about death, I said. I don't know where the stranger is supposed to come from. Listen to me, Legion, Foster said. There was a hint of the old anxious look in his eyes. I think I know what the change was. I think he knew he would forget. You've got amnesia on the brain, old buddy, I said. And the stranger is himself, a man without a memory. I sat frowning at Foster. Yeah, maybe, I said. Go on. And he says that all the stranger needs to know is there, in the book. Not in the part I decoded, I said. He describes how they're coming along with the road-building job, and how the new mine panned out. But there's nothing about what the hunters are, or what had gone on before he tangled with them the first time. It must be their legion, but in the first section, the part written in alien symbols. Maybe, I said, but why the hell didn't he give us a key to that part? I think he assumed that the stranger, himself, would remember the old writing, Foster said. How could he know that it would be forgotten with the rest? Your guess is as good as any, I said. Maybe better. You know how it feels to lose your memory. But we've learned a few things, Foster said. The pit of the hunters. We have the location. If you call this ten thousand parts to the west of Chalkface a location, I said. We know more than that, Foster said. He mentions a plane, and it must lie on a continent to the east. If you assume that he sailed from Europe to America, then the continent to the east would be Europe, I said. But maybe he went from Africa to South America, or... The mention of northern sailors. That suggests the Vikings. You seem to know a little history, Foster, I said. You've got a lot of odd facts tucked away. We need maps, Foster said. We'll look for a plane near the sea. Not necessarily and with a formation called a chalk face to the east. What's this median line business, I said, and the bit about ten thousand parts of something? I don't know, but we must have maps. I bought some this afternoon, I said. I also got a dime store globe. I figured we might need them. Let's get out of this and back to the room where we can spread out. I know it's a grim prospect, but... I got to my feet, dropped some coins on the oilcloth-covered table, and led the way out. It was a short half-block to the flea trap we called home. We kept out of it as much as we could, holding our long daily conferences across the street at the Novidadas. The roaches scurried as we passed up the dark stairway to our not much brighter room. I crossed to the bureau and opened a drawer. The globe, Foster said, taking it in his hands. I wonder if perhaps he meant a ten-thousandth part of the circumference of the earth. What would he know about— Disregard the anachronistic aspect of it, Foster said. The man who wrote the book knew many things. We'll have to start with some assumptions. Let's make the obvious ones. That we're looking for a plane on the west coast of Europe lying— He pulled a chair up to the scabrous table and riffled through to one of my scribbled sheets. Fifty ten thousandths of the circumference of the earth. That would be about a hundred and twenty five miles west of a chalk formation, and three thousand six hundred seventy five miles north of a median line. Maybe, I said, he means the equator. Certainly, why not? That would mean our plane lies on a line through, he studied the small globe, Warsaw, and south of Amsterdam. But this part about a rock outcropping, I said. How do we find out if there's any conspicuous chalk formation around there? We can consult the geology text. There may be a library in this neighborhood. The only chalk deposits I ever heard about, I said, are the White Cliffs of Dover. White Cliffs? 
We both reached for the globe at once. One hundred twenty-five miles west of the chalk cliffs, said Foster. He ran a finger over the globe. North of London, but south of Birmingham. That puts us reasonably near the sea. Where's the atlas? I said. I rummaged, came up with a cheap tourist's edition, flipped the pages. Here's England, I said. Now we look for a plane. Foster put a finger on the map. Here, he said. A large plane, called Salisbury. Large is right, I said. It would take years to find a stone cairn on that. We're getting excited about nothing. We're looking for a hole in the ground hundreds of years old, if this lousy notebook means anything. Maybe marked with a few stones. In the middle of miles of plain. And it's all guesswork anyway. I took the atlas, turned the page. I don't know what I expected to be getting out of decoding those pages, I said, but I was hoping for more than this. I think we should try, Legion, Foster said. We can go there, search over the ground. It would be costly, but not impossible. We can start by gathering capital. Wait a minute, Foster, I said. I was staring at a larger-scale map showing southern England. Suddenly my heart was thudding. I put a finger on a tiny dot in the center of Salisbury Plain. Six, two, and even, I said. There's your pit of the hunters. Foster leaned over, read the fine print. Stonehenge. I read from the encyclopedia page. This great stone structure, lying on the plain of Salisbury, Wiltshire, England, is preeminent among megalithic monuments of the ancient world. Within a circular ditch three hundred feet in diameter, stones up to twenty-two feet in height are arranged in concentric circles. The central altar stone, over sixteen feet long, is approached from the northeast by a broad roadway called the Avenue. It is not an altar, Foster said. How do you know? Because, Foster frowned, I know, that's all. The journal said the stones were arranged in the sign of the two worlds, I said. That means the concentric circles, I suppose. The same thing that's stamped on the cover of the notebook. And the ring, Foster said. Let me read the rest. A great sarsen stone stands upright in the avenue. The axis through the two stones, when erected, pointed directly to the rising of the sun on midsummer day. Calculations based on this observation indicate a date of approximately 1600 B.C. Foster took the book, and I sat on the windowsill and looked out at a big Florida moon over the ragged lines of roofs, with a skinny royal palm sticking up in silhouette. It didn't look much like the postcard views of Miami. I lit a cigarette and thought about a man who long ago had crossed the North Atlantic in a dragon boat to be a god among the Indians. I wondered where he came from, and what it was he was looking for, and what kept him going in spite of the hell that showed up in the spare lines of the journal he kept. If, I reminded myself, he had ever existed. Foster was poring over the book. Look, I said, let's get back to Earth. We have things to think about, plans to make. The fairy tales can wait until later. What do you suggest? Foster said. That we forget the things you've told me, and the things we've read here? Discard the journal and abandon the attempt to find the answers? No, I said. I'm no sorehead. Sure, there's some things here that somebody ought to look into. Some day. But right now what I want is the cops off my neck. And I've been thinking. I'll dictate a letter. You write it. Your lawyers know your handwriting. Tell them you were on the thin edge of a nervous breakdown. That's why all the artillery around your house. And you made up your mind suddenly to get away from it all. Tell them you don't want to be bothered. That's why you're traveling incognito. And that the northern mobster that came to see you was just stupid, not a killer. That ought to at least cool off the cops. Foster looked thoughtful. That's an excellent suggestion, he said. Then we need merely to arrange for passage to England and proceed with the investigation. You don't get the idea, I said. You can arrange things by mail so we get our hands on that dough of yours. Any such attempt would merely bring the police down on us, Foster said. 
You've already pointed out the unwisdom of attempting to pass myself off as... myself. There ought to be a way, I said. We have only one avenue of inquiry, Foster said. We have no choice but to explore it. We'll take passage on a ship to England. What do we use for money? And papers? It would cost hundreds. Unless, I added, we worked our way. But that's no good. We'd still need passports, plus union cards and seamen's tickets. Your friend, Foster said, the one who prepares passports. Can't he produce the other papers as well? Yeah, I said, I guess so, but it will cost us. I'm sure we can find a way to pay, Foster said. Will you see him early in the morning? I looked around the blousy room. Hot night air stirred a geranium wilting in a tin can on the windowsill. An odor of bad cooking and worse plumbing floated up from the street. At least, I said, it would mean getting out of here. End of chapter 4《Chapter Five of A Trace of Memory by Keith Laumer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. It was almost sundown when Foster and I pushed through the door to the saloon bar at the ancient sinner and found a corner table. I watched Foster spread out his maps and papers. Behind us there was a murmur of conversation and the thump of darts against a board. When are you going to give up and admit we're wasting our time? I said. Two weeks of tramping over the same ground and we end up in the same place. We've hardly begun our investigation, Foster said mildly. You keep saying that, I said. But if there ever was anything in that rock pile, it's long gone. The archaeologists have been digging over the site for years and they haven't come up with anything. They don't know what to look for. Foster said. They were searching for indications of religious significance, human sacrifice, that sort of thing. We don't know what we're looking for either, I said, unless you think maybe we'll meet the hunters hiding under a loose stone. You say that sardonically, Foster said, but I don't consider it impossible. I know, I said. You've convinced yourself that the hunters were after us back at Mayport when we ran off like a pair of idiots. From what you've told me of the circumstances, Foster began, I know, you don't consider it impossible. That's the trouble with you. You don't consider anything impossible. It would make life a lot easier for me if you'd let me rule out a few items, like leprechauns who hang out at Stonehenge. Foster looked at me, half smiling. It had only been a few weeks since he woke up from a nap looking like a senior class president who hadn't made up his mind whether to be a preacher or a movie star. But he had already lost that mild, innocent air. He learned fast, and day by day I had seen his old personality reemerge, and, in spite of my attempts to hold on to the ascendancy, dominate our partnership. It's a failing of your culture, Foster said, that hypothesis becomes dogma almost overnight. You're too close to your Neolithic when the blind acceptance of tribal lore had survival value. Having learned to evoke the fire god from sticks, by rote you tend to extend the principle to all established facts. Here's an established fact for you, I said. We've got fifteen pounds left. That's about forty dollars. It's time we figure out where to go from here, before somebody starts checking up on those phony papers of ours. Foster shook his head. I'm not satisfied that we've exhausted the possibilities here. I've been studying the geometric relationships between the various structures. I have some ideas I want to check. I think it might be a good idea to go out at night, when we can work without the usual crowd of tourists observing every move. I groaned. Oh, my dogs are killing me, I said. Let's hope you'll come up with something better, or at least different. We'll have a bite to eat here, and wait until dark to start out, Foster said. The publican brought us plates of cold meat and potato salad. I worked on a thin but durable slice of ham, and thought about all the people, somewhere, who were sitting down now to gracious meals in the glitter of crystal and silver. 
I've had too many greasy french fries in too many cheap dives the last few years. I could feel them all now, burning in my stomach. I was getting farther from my island all the time, and it was nobody's fault but mine. The ancient sinner, I said. That's me. Foster looked up. Curious names these old pubs have, he said. I suppose in some cases the origins are lost in antiquity. Why don't they think up something cheery, I said, like the Paradise Bar and Grill or the Happy Hour Cafe? Did you notice the sign hanging outside? No. A picture of a skeleton. He's holding one hand up like a Yankee evangelist prophesying doom. You can see it through the window there. Foster turned and looked at the weathered sign creaking in the evening wind. He looked at it for a long time. When he turned back, there was a strange look around his eyes. What's the matter? I started. Foster ignored me, waved to the proprietor, a short, fat countryman. He came over to the table, wiping his hands on his apron. A very interesting old building, Foster said. We've been admiring it. When was it built? Well, sir, the publican said, this here house is many a hundred year old. It were built by the monks, they say, from the monastery, what used to stand nearby here. It were tore down by the king's men, Henry, that was, what time he drove the papists out. That would be Henry the Eighth, I suppose? Aye, it would that. And the house is all that were spared, it being the Bruin house, as the king said were a worthwhile institution. And he laid on a tithe that two kegs of stout was to be laid by for the king's use each brewing time. Very interesting, Foster said. Is the custom still continued? The publican shook his head. It were ended in my grandfather's time, it being that the queen were a teetotaler. How did it acquire the curious name, the ancient sinner? The tale is, the publican said, that one day a lay brother of the order were digging about yonder on the plain by the great stones, in search of the druid's treasure, albeit the abbot had forbid him to go nigh the heathen ground. And he come on the bones of a man, and, being of a kindly turn, he had the thought to give them Christian burial. Now, knowing the abbot would nay permit it, he set to work to dig a grave by moonlight in holy ground, under the monastery walls. But the abbot, being wakeful, were abroad, and come on the brother a-diggin, and when he asked why of it, the lay brother, having visions of penances to burden him for many a day, he ups and tells the abbot it were an ale-cellar he were about diggin. And the abbot, not being without wisdom, clapped him on the back and went on his way. And so it was the ale-house got built and blessed by the abbot and with it the bones that was laid away under the floor beneath the ale-casks. So the ancient sinner is buried under the floor? Aye, so the tale goes, though I've not dug for him myself. But the house has been known by the name these four hundred years. Where was it you said the lay brother was digging? On the plain, yonder, by the druid stones, what they call Stonehenge, the publican said. He picked up the empty glasses. What about another gentleman? Certainly, Foster said. He sat quietly across from me, his features composed, but I could see there was tension under the surface calm. What's this all about? I asked softly. When did you get so interested in local history? Later, Foster murmured. Keep looking bored. That'll be easy, I said. The publican came back and placed heavy glass mugs before us. You were telling us about the lay brothers finding the bones, Foster said. You say they were buried in Stonehenge? The publican cleared his throat, glanced sideways at Foster. <clears throat> the gentleman wouldn't be from the university now, I suppose, he said. Let's just say, Foster said easily, smiling, that we have a great interest in these bits of lore. An interest supported by modest funds, of course. The publican made a show of wiping at the rings on the table-top. "'A costly business, I wager,' he said, digging about in odd places and all. "'Now knowing where to dig, 
That's important, I'll be bound. Very important, Foster said. Worth five pounds, easily. Twere my grandfather told me of the spot. Took me out by moonlight, he did, and showed me where his grandfather had showed him. Told me it were a fine great secret, the likes of which a simple man could well take pride in. And an additional five pounds, as a token of my personal esteem, Foster said. The publican eyed me. Well, a secret as was handed down father to son. And, of course, my associate wishes to express his esteem, too, Foster said. Another five pounds worth. That's all the esteem the budget will bear, Mr. Foster, I said. I got out the fifteen pounds and passed the money across to him. I hope you haven't forgotten those people back home who wanted to talk to us, I said. They'll be getting in touch with us any time now, I'll bet. Foster rolled up the bills and held them in his hand. That's true, Mr. Legion, he said. Perhaps we shouldn't take the time. But being it's for the advancement of science, the publican said, I'm willing to make the sacrifice. We'll want to go out tonight, Foster said. We have a very tight schedule. The landlord dickered with Foster for another five minutes before he agreed to guide us to the spot where the skeleton had been found. When he left, I began, Now, tell me. Look at the signboard again, Foster said. I looked. The skull smiled, holding up a hand. I see it, I said, but it doesn't explain why you handed over our last buck. Look at the hand. Look at the ring on the finger. I looked again. A heavy ring was painted on the bony index finger with a pattern of concentric circles. It was a duplicate of the one on Foster's finger. The publican pulled the battered Morris Minor to the side of the highway and set the brake. This is as close as we best take the machine, he said. We got out, looked across the rolling plain, where the megaliths of Stonehenge loomed against the last glow of sunset. The publican rummaged in the boot, produced a ragged blanket and two long four-cell flashlights, gave one to Foster and the other to me. Then I use the electric torches until I tell you, he said, lest the whole county see there's folks abroad here. We watched as he draped the blanket over a barbed wire fence, clambered over, and started across the barren field. Foster and I followed, not talking. The plain was deserted. A few lonely lights showed on a distant slope. It was a dark night with no moon. I could hardly see the ground ahead. A car moved along a distant road, its headlights bobbing. We moved past the outer ring of stones, skirting fallen slabs twenty feet long. We'll break our necks, I said. Let's have one of the flashlights. Not yet, Foster whispered. Our guide paused. We came up to him. It were a mortal long time since I were last hereabouts, he said. I must take me bearings off the friar's heel. What's that? Yon great stone standing alone in the avenue. We squinted. It was barely visible as a dark shape against the sky. The bones were buried there? Foster asked. Nay, all by their self they was. Now it were twenty paces, Grantford said, him being fifteen stone and long in the leg. The publican muttered to himself, pacing off distances. What's to keep him from just pointing to a spot after a while, I said to Foster, and saying, this is it. We'll wait and see, Foster said. They were a hollow, as it were, in the earth, the publican said, with a bit of stone by it. I reckon it were fifty paces from here, he pointed. Yonder. I don't see anything, I said. Let's take a closer look. Foster started off, and I followed the publican trailing behind. I made out a dim shape with a deep depression in the earth before it. This could be the spot, Foster said. Old graves often sink. Suddenly he grabbed my arm. Look! The surface of the ground before us seemed to tremble, then heave. Foster snapped on his flashlight. The earth at the bottom of the hollow rose, cracked open. A boiling mass of luminescence churned and a globe of light separated itself 
rose, bumbling along the face of the weathered stone. "'Saints preserve us!' the publican said in a choked voice. Foster and I stood rooted to the spot, watching. The lone globe rose higher, and abruptly shot straight toward us. Foster threw up an arm and ducked. The ball of light veered, struck him a glancing blow, darted off a few yards, hovered. In an instant the air was alive with the spheres, boiling up from the ground and hurtling toward us, buzzing like a hive of yellow jackets. Foster's flashlight lanced out toward the swarm. "'Use your light, Legion!' he shouted hoarsely. I was still standing, frozen. The globes rushed straight at Foster, ignoring me. Behind me I heard the publican turn and run. I fumbled with the flashlight switch, snapped it on, swung the beam of white light on Foster. The globe at his head vanished as the light touched it. More globes swarmed to Foster, and popped like soap bubbles in the flashlight's glare. But more swarmed to take their places. Foster reeled, fighting at them. He swung the light, and I heard it smash against the stone behind him. In the instant darkness the globes clustered thick around his head. Foster! I yelled. Run! He got no more than five yards before he staggered, went to his knees. Cover! he croaked. He fell on his face. I rushed the mass of darting globes, took up a stance, straddling his body. A sulfurous reek hung around me. I coughed, concentrated on beaming the lights around Foster's head. No more were rising from the crack in the earth now. A suffocating cloud pressed around both of us, but it was Foster they went for. I thought of the slab. If I could get my back to it, I might have a chance. I stooped, got a grip on Foster's coat, and started back, dragging him. The lights boiled around me. I swept the beam of light and kept going until my back slammed against the stone. I crouched against it. Now they could only come from the front. I glanced at the cleft the lights had come from. It looked big enough to get Foster into. That would give him some protection. I tumbled him over the edge, then flattened my back against the slab and settled down to fight in earnest. I worked in a pattern, sweeping vertically, then horizontally. The globes ignored me, drove toward the cleft, fighting to get at Foster, and I swept them away as they came. The cloud around me was smaller now, the attack less ravenous. I picked out individual globes, snuffed them out. The hum became ragged, faltered. Then there were only a few globes around me, milling wildly, disorganized. The last half-dozen fled, bumbling across the plain. I slumped against the rock, sweat running down into my eyes, my lungs burning with the sulfur. Foster! I gasped. Are you all right? He didn't answer. I flashed the light onto the cleft. It showed me damp clay, a few pebbles. Foster was gone. End of chapter 5